Sunday, May 28, 1978. From the world-famed Indianapolis Motor Speedway. In Indianapolis, Indiana, it's the 1978 Indianapolis 500. This ABC Sports exclusive is brought to you by Goodyear. When we race, you win. By Fram, makers of oil, air, and fuel filters, windshield wipers, and Autolite spark plugs. By the Coca-Cola Company and all the people who bring you the bright, refreshing taste of Coca-Cola. Coke adds life to just about everything you do. And by Toyota. Toyota hopes you enjoy today's race. You asked for it, you've got it. When it began a long time ago, there still were many more horses than there were automobiles in the state of Indiana. It was 1911, a year when World War I still lay in the future, when there was no television and no radio. But the racetrack you see today is exactly the same as then, except that then it was surfaced with paving bricks. There's no way to show you all of the people, some 350 to 400,000 of them, who have gathered here since the gates opened at 5 o'clock this morning. 250,000 are in seats, the rest stand in the infield. It's more than a sports event, really. It's an annual occasion. The weather today, well, it's the way we think of Memorial Day weekend. Hot, 85 degrees at the moment, and terribly humid. It's summertime in the American Midwest. And now it's time for another tradition here, the singing of Back Home Again in Indiana by Jim Neighbors and just about everyone else spread out around the sprawling two-and-a-half-mile race course. And so this exciting month of May began for us with the playing of my old Kentucky home at Churchill Downs and now nears its climax with that rendition of Back Home Again in Indiana here at the Speedway. But maybe you're not an automobile racing fan. Maybe you've never seen the Indy 500 before. Briefly, it is a 500-mile race that 200 laps of this two-and-a-half-mile racetrack for specially built and prepared open-wheel racing cars. They'll develop up to 900 horsepower, well over 200 miles an hour. In the first race in 1911, they averaged 75. This year, an unusual situation, a rookie on the first row, the only four-time winner in the seventh row, and maybe the fastest car in the field starting all the way at the back. Let's bring in for further word on that our expert on the sport, former world driving champion, Jackie Stewart. Jackie, it's clear, but it's hot. Well, it's very hot, but it's great to be back at Indianapolis again. What an event. The heat, well, it's up close to about 90 degrees right now, and this, of course, is going to have a tremendous effect both on cars and drivers. From the driver's point of view, Jim, 500 miles is a long way to be in this cramped cockpits of these racing cars, tremendously tiring on a driver, both mentally and physically. From the car's point of view, obviously, they're going to suffer. Not only the tires, but, of course, the transmissions, and most of all, the engines. Revving as they have to around this super speedway, it's a hard day on them, and I'm sure we're going to see a lot of attrition. I think from my point of view the most interesting factor is that we've got a 200 mile an hour front row. Then we've got A.J. Foyt back on the seventh row, very fast. With along him, alongside him is Bobby Unser. Right at the back, Mario Andretti, man who's leading the world championship in road racing now, one of the great chargers. The first two or three laps, Jim, are going to be absolutely incredible. No question of that. And of course here at Indianapolis the real story is the men, much more than the machines. And you have sat in that car just before the beginning of this race. 
The tenseness, Jim, I can't explain it to you. The drivers are all wrapped up in their thermal underwear. They've got these heavy-duty racing overalls on. They've got their crash helmets, of course, balaclavas below them. Their perspiration is running off them right now, and yet their mouths are very, very dry. They don't want to be bothered, some of them. Others want to be talking. The pulse rate is racing. No contact lenses in, no dentures in, just in the case of an accident. They're very, very tense indeed. They don't, all want, they don't even want to leave the solitude of their garage or in Gasoline Alley. They don't care, I don't care who it is, whether it's A.J. Foyt, who's been here, oh, 21 times, this will be his 21st start, or whether it's a young man like Rick Mears. The nerves are just the same, and the pressure is just incredible. Jackie, as you know, the owner of the Speedway, Tony Holman, has died since last year's race. And there's a bit of a mystery here. Who is going to say the traditional call of, gentlemen, start your engines? Nobody seems to know, but we'll find out in a minute. Indianapolis Speedway is a sentimental place for all its accent on technical excellence and harsh reality. That sentiment was personified by the much admired owner of the track, Tony Holman, who died last autumn. There's been a lot of speculation and some mystery this month as to who would succeed Tony to utter the words, gentlemen, start your engines. New President Joe Cloutier said he would not be the one, but he would not reveal who it would be. Well, most appropriately, it is going to be the widow of Tony Holman, Mary Holman. There's Mrs. Holman now, obviously moved by this moment. Lady! Lady and gentlemen, start your engines. You can't! A sentimental moment at Indianapolis, Mrs. Mary Holman. Another first for Indy. Not too many years ago, women were not even allowed in the pits or the garage area. Now we have a woman driver in the race and a woman officially starting the race with the phrase, as you heard, lady and gentlemen, start your engine. And that's what has happened. It looks like everybody is getting started pretty well. I don't see anybody having a major problem. Looks like they're going to be okay. Al Unser there, he'll be in the middle of the second row. Car number two. A.J. Foyt is way in the back. And now the mechanics and the press and everyone else must depart, leaving them all alone. There is the man on the pole, Tom Sneva. This is the time when 32 men and a woman are looked at by hundreds of thousands on the scene and many millions more watching on television. Nonetheless, they're all alone, like these men on the front row, each in his or her tiny, fast-flying world. There's A.J. Foyt, way back in the seventh row, the defending champion, only four-time winner of the row, of the race, but he qualified on the last day, therefore was placed seventh, although he's very fast. Next to him, Bobby Unser, a uh, two-time winner. Mario Andretti, last in the field, although perhaps with the fastest car, that's because he had to have another man qualify his car, remember, he was off winning the Grand Prix of Belgium. And so it's a very topsy-turvy, almost inside-out kind of starting field in some ways. They're underway now. And what will these lonesome people see as they tour the track? Well, let's take a run with Jackie Stewart. I drive out the pits in the A.J. Foyt Coyote. Keeping below the yellow line there as we go through turn one. This is the acceleration lane going out onto the racetrack. You get on to the turn one corner there just as you leave the turn one and head into turn two. This is where I spun when I first came to Indianapolis in 66. Not a pleasant experience. Now you go through turn two and you head towards the backstretch, this long 3,000 foot backstretch where the driver looks at his gauges, the tire profiles and where perhaps he can pass because they draft along this stretch doing speeds of up to 230 miles an hour. They slip past going into turn three here passing the car on the inside as they commit themselves to turn three. It used to be very bumpy, but the racetrack was resurfaced back last year. You get close to the wall between three and four and then commit the car to turn four. A dramatic corner. I also hit the wall here in 67. Not a pleasant experience either, but as you go down this front stretch, again, 3,300 feet in length, people on both sides of you, a tremendous feeling of speed as you go down there. You take your pit signals from the left-hand side there as the crews give you your information and head again to turn one. Corner speeds here up to 185 miles an hour. What a speed, what a lap. That's what they'll be looking at then, but right now they're on the parade lap and all the cars, we would repeat, were started successfully. Everybody is underway and on the parade lap. We'll be right back for the start. We're back in the ABC commentary booth at Indianapolis. Jim McKay here with former world driving champion Jackie Stewart. 
The crowd, well, they don't give an official attendance here, but the more than 250,000 seats that they have have long since been filled. The infield is jammed. They're guessing somewhere between 350 and 400,000 people on this hot Memorial Day weekend. Jackie, there is, in fact, nothing like it. There's nothing like it in the world. I've seen a lot of sporting events, certainly a lot of motor racing. There's nothing more exciting, more glamorous or more colorful than this moment here at Indianapolis. It's unbearable. Even for me as a driver, I think I'm more tense, more nervous as I'm sitting here, Jim, than I've ever been <laughs> sitting in a race car. Who's going to win, sir? Ah, I thought you would ask that. <laughs> I think it has to be one of the Penske cars. Now, I'm taking a wild gamble because there's three of those cars entered. There's there's, of course, Tom Sneever in the pole, Rick Mears, and then, of course, Mario Andretti. It's never been won for a long, long, long time, I don't think, from the pole. And I would have to choose, I think, Tom Sneever. I'll take the man just in back of him, Johnny Rutherford. How about that? Not a bad bet. We're very close to the start now. And, in fact, the cars are on the parade lap. There they are. There were a couple of pace cars out in front originally, and one of them was young Tony George, the grandson and namesake of the late Tony Hallman and his daughter Mary was with him too. Let's check the starting grid now. These are the faces behind the masks in the first two rows of the 1978 Indianapolis 500. For the first time in a long while, there's no former winner in the first row, but there are three of them in the second. Tom Sneva, the former school teacher from Spokane, won the pole position for the second straight year with that record four lap average of 202.156. His luck here has not always been that good. In 1975, he somehow survived this horrifying crash in turn two, driving again and winning before the season was out. Quite a contrast, though, to this year, when his first lap was a record speed of more than 203 miles an hour. Tom Sneva, second in the race last year, now sitting on the pole as he was last year in the Roger Penske team car number one. Danny Angaias is a placid, quiet Hawaiian. After a career on motorcycles and in drag racers, he finds himself at age 36 on the front row at Indianapolis. In March of this year, he served notice that he would be a major factor this season by winning a 200-mile race in Ontario, California. He had one dicey moment here this month when he crashed during practice in his backup car. He was 20th last year, was Danny Angaias. But now he starts in second position in the Interscope team car number 25. Danny Angaias. At age 26, Rick Mears of Ventura, California is living a dream. It's a great surprise to him that he's the first rookie in 21 years to sit on the first row. He has raced on road circuits and across the western desert, but Indianapolis is something entirely different, and Mears' poise was most impressive as he qualified at over 200 miles an hour. Unquestionably, he has a marvelous car, number 71, one of the three Penske cars built in England for this race, powered by British Cosworth engines. Rick Mears, rookie on the first row. And now, a row of former champions. Johnny Rutherford has twice won the 500 in 14 attempts. As the lone star hope of the British team McLaren, Rutherford, at age 40, used his backup car to qualify. His speed, almost three miles an hour slower than Rick Mears, is still plenty fast enough to possibly win the race. His car is number four, John Rutherford. Middle of row two, right behind on Gaius, is another two-time winner, Al Unser. He won back-to-back -back 500s in 1970 and 71. Now he drives for a new team in a Cosworth-powered Lola prepared by Jim Hall, the millionaire former sports car driver and designer from Texas. Unser and Hall make an intriguing pair for this year's race, car number two. Rounding out the second row is another former winner, Gordon Johncock, the star of the team managed by George Bignotti, master mechanic of the Speedway. Bignotti has sent more winners to the post than any other chief mechanic in Indianapolis history. Gordy Johncock, car number 20. There are other stars, however, much farther back. For example, Bobby Unser was classified as a third-day qualifier, so despite his excellent qualifying speed, he'll start on the inside of the seventh row. It's an unaccustomed starting spot for this two-time Indy champion. He will sit on a brand-new eagle prepared by Dan Gurney. Brand new and therefore perhaps questionable as to its potential in this race. Bobby Unser in the Gurney car number 48. Next to Bobby, again surprisingly, will be the defending champion and only four-time winner, the remarkable Anthony Joseph Foyt Jr. of Houston, Texas. A.J. had mechanical problems on the first day, which cost him a spot on the first row. His speed was actually exactly the same as that of Danny Ungaius. 
He drives a Coyote race car, which he built. He also built his own eight-cylinder Foyt engine, Foyt, number 14. And then there's Mario Andretti. He was off winning the Grand Prix of Belgium last weekend after being rained out here the week before. That meant that a substitute, Mike Hiss, had to qualify his car for him. That's perfectly legal, but the rule also states that a car driven by a man other than the man who qualified it must be started at the back of the pack. Andretti then, in perhaps the fastest car of all, number seven, another Penske car will start dead last. And we'll see the start in a minute. The Pirates battle the Phillies, the Giants take on the Astros, and the Orioles meet the Tigers. Check local listings for ABC's Monday Night Baseball. Now you've met the cars on the first two rows. Let's check row number three on the inside. Car number six will be Wally Dallenbeck. In the middle, in the red car number 16, we have Johnny Parsons. There you see it in the middle of the racetrack. And the blue car on the outside, number 80, is Larry Dixon. Row number four on the inside, number 17, is Dick Simon. He's tried everything from parachuting to ski jumping to this. In the middle, the veteran Roger McCluskey, number 11. And on the outside, number 24 is Sheldon Kinzer. In row five, on the inside, car number 40 is Steve Krisloff, the teammate of Gordon Johncock. In the middle, rookie Tom Bagley in car number 22. And on the outside, the only woman in the race, car number 51, Janet Guthrie. In row number six, on the inside, we will have number 19, Spike Gelhausen. In the middle, John Mailer in car number 39, and on the outside, number 43, Tom Bigelow. In row number seven, a most significant row. On the inside, a former two-time winner, Bobby Unser in car number 48, the car prepared by Dan Gurney. They won it as a team before, and there, car number 14, is the remarkable A.J. Foyt after his fifth Indianapolis 500 victory. And on the outside, another excellent driver in car number eight there, we have Pancho Carter on the comeback trail after a terrible accident last fall in practice. In row number eight, number 77, Salt Walton, unfortunately most remembered for his crash here in 1973. In the middle, A.J. Foyt's backup car, number 84, driven by George Snyder. And on the outside, number 69 is Joe Saldana. In row number nine, number 78, is Mike Mosley, who got a ride only at the last day of qualifying. Number 26, the veteran Jim McElree. Number 29, Cliff Husel. Row 10, 88, Jerry Carl. 47, Phil Freshy. 35, Larry Rice. They're both rookies. The last row, Gary Bettenhausen had a pull into the pits in car number 98, so he isn't there. In the middle, Jerry Steven, number 30, and Mario Andretti in number 7, perhaps the fastest car in the field, starting dead last on the outside of row number 11. They should be getting the green flag because Jim Rathman has pulled the pace car off the track. Starter Pat Badan still does not have the green flag out. Here they come to the starting line, and the green flag is out. They're racing in Indianapolis. And it's Danny and Gaius quickly taking the lead from Tom Sneva. Johnny Rutherford is in third place, and Rick Mears has dropped back. Rick Mears dropped right back, and my goodness, the two lead cars. Danny and Gaius, who's famous for his efforts at the beginning of a race, and car number 25, the black car, there you see him. Took quite a jump on the rest of the field. It wasn't the tidiest race start that I've ever seen in Indianapolis, but on Gaius certainly didn't take a second look. He certainly didn't. The 36-year-old Danny and Gaius, remember, in only his second Indianapolis 500, Sitting on the middle of the first row, grabbed the lead, very authoritatively. Tom Sneva, the pole sitter, is in second position. Johnny Rutherford, third, and I don't know what happened to Mears on the start, do you? There is car number 24, Sheldon Kinzer, pulling down low off the racetrack. That's two cars already that have had problems. The attrition rate, as Jackie indicated, should be very high. As they go past here again, of course, it's the black car there, Danny on guys, then it's Tom Steva, then Johnny Rutherford, and after that, Gordon John Cork, a man who everybody expects to do well. But my goodness, leading the Indy 500 is always something to be a great thrill, and that man, Danny on guys, has done it. The first lap is a new first lap record, 185.185 miles per hour with a full load of fuel. Tremendous for Ungaius, a tremendously talented man, a very quiet man. And look at the bunch getting up there for third, fourth, fifth, and sixth position. That's Johnny Rutherford leading that pack there. The man still in front. And there's the car of Bettenhausen in the pitch, car number 89. 98. 98 uh, Gary Bettenhausen. What a disappointment for him. The traditional number 98 of J.C. Agajanian. And there's Sheldon Kinzer slowing on the race course, but well down low. He should be out of the way. But the yellow flag is now out at Indianapolis. 
we would think that would be for Sheldon Kinzer, Jackie, from what we can see here. He is on the race course. He would be considered to be an obstacle on the racetrack, and of course when the cars are so tightly bunched at the beginning of a race like this, it's very easy for them not to see a slow car travelling down. Some other car could dive out behind a group of cars and run straight into that slow car. So that's the reason for the yellow flag. And all these yellows are going to use more fuel, and they're going to make uh, much harder wear on the engines. The attrition rate should be tremendous. Now they're under what are called pacer lights here at Indianapolis. Let's have Jackie explain that for us. In some forms of racing, such as stock car racing and even Grand Prix racing, when the yellow light or yellow flag is shown, the driver who might have a 30 second lead could lose that lead by the drivers behind him closing up and grouping behind that lead car. Here at Indianapolis, it was considered that this would be unfair. Therefore, something new was introduced a few years ago. They were called pace lights. Let me try and explain what they are. There are eight of those pacer lights around the racetrack. When the driver passes a pacer light, if, for example, number two is up there, he should reach the next pacer light, which is 1,600 feet along the road, and still see number two. If, for example, he sees number three up there, it means that he's going too slowly. If, on the other hand, he sees number one, it means that he's going too quickly. So it's this way, and only this way, that he knows if he's traveling at the right pace. And this obviously helps him to keep the gap behind the car in front of him to the prescribed distance. The officials here feel that this is the method that they can use to keep these cars going around the track at 80 miles an hour, because that's the figure that they consider to be safe while emergency crews are perhaps working on the racetrack. Remember this, there is no pace car around this racetrack now, and it means that if any driver goes too fast, he will be penalised. Of course, it's extremely difficult to police such a, a regulation, and this is what the officials have to try to do here at Indianapolis. Well, Jackie, you've explained the pacer lights, but it looks like Tom Sneva has, in fact, closed up on Ungaius. He certainly seems to have closed up a few yards. He can probably do this and get off with it just for a few laps, but uh, these yards are going to be noted by the officials, and if for any reason they thought he had unreasonably closed up, certainly there could be action. A.J. Foyt has gone from 20th position to 14th on the first two laps. He passed nine cars. Mario has gone from 33rd to 24th. They're moving up. Still under the yellow at Indianapolis, and we'll be right back. We're back again at the Indianapolis 500. Salt Walther in the pits very early in the race, and that's happened to him before here at Indianapolis on a number of occasions. The 30-year-old race driver from Dayton, Ohio. He's had a lot of bad luck around here. Back out on the race course again, however. We're going to take a look right now at A.J. Foyt on the first lap. Remember, he started way back in the seventh row, and look at him pass car, the orange car, number 14. Bobby Unser right with him in the black and orange. Look at him carving his way through there. It's amazing how he's getting through this traffic. The rest of the drivers obviously feeding their way through there as quietly as possible. A.J. taking every opportunity, right straddling the yellow line there. Look at him getting inside of that car as he goes through there out of turn two and down the back stretch. Obviously turning the turbo up to try and get himself in the green light goes out at the same time here as you can see the green being shown. All right, now remember what we saw of A.J. Foy was an isolated replay of A.J. on the first lap in the race. Now we're back to the current standings, and here is Danny Ungaius out in front. Tom Steva, very close to him, however, about 100 yards back, and they're going at speeds of about 185 miles an hour. That means they're going the length of a football field every second when they're coming down the home stretch and the back stretch. Coming onto the back stretch down there, of course, they are slipstreaming or drafting, and there you see that car. He's just within the draft, even if it looks quite a long way on the racetrack. Danny on guys, his car in a small way is breaking the air and allowing Tom Sneva to be sucked along just that little bit. There you got some feeling of the speed from that low speed shot on Gaius. And Tom Steve out in front, just behind them, you can see Gordon Johncock, no, number 20, and he's very closely followed by number four, Johnny Rutherford, and number two, Al Unser. Those are the three cars in your picture right now, the blue and white, Gordon Johncock. Behind him, Johnny Rutherford, and just out of the picture there now is Al Unser, who is in fifth place in the race. Up in front again, though, Danny Ungaius, only his second Indianapolis 500 at age 36. Steve in second place at the moment is in his fifth Indy at age 29. 
and of course he finished second in last year's Indianapolis 500 Danny Ungaius one of the chargers one of the men that at the start of each race has gone out there and done well and look Clint Fusel comes into the pits what a disappointment for him so early in the race under the green light and for the country of Canada Cliff Fusel the only racer from north of the border in the Indianapolis 500 again back to that race for third place John Cox at the moment in third place followed by Rutherford and Al Unser Every one of these, a former winner. John Cox won it once, Rutherford's won it twice, and so is Al Unser. Very hot, and of course, the car of Gordon John Cox, a four-cylinder car, the Offie car, of course, the other two cars being powered by the Cosworth, a British-made engine, and look at them as they go down there, the car number two there, really tucking himself in behind, Al Unser tucking himself in behind that car of Rutherford's there. Very experienced drivers, not getting themselves out of shape. And here, two less experienced drivers. Again, Ungaius only in his second 500. And Sneven, who crashed here a couple of years ago, much more experienced now, but still with not the experience of having won the race once, which makes a big difference, doesn't it, Jackie? Oh, the winning barrier is an amazing thing. It's difficult to find the key to open the door of winning, and so many drivers go for so long without finding that key, and there's a the car there. That's, that's Sheldon Sh Kinzer, Jackie, number 24, and stopped he... on the racetrack. And he had his arm in the air there, just in case a driver did not see that he was traveling at not miles an hour. And the yellow flag not out as yet. I thought we might get a yellow on Kinzer because they did earlier when he was down low. Now he's dead stopped. And now the yellow's out. Here it is. They're under the yellow. That means they must slow down, if you call it slow, to 80 miles an hour. Uh, Chris Akatamaki down in the pits. Let's go down there. Okay, the leader is Danny Ongaius, his car owner is Parnelli Jones, who won here 15 years ago. He's going 191 and a half, Parnelli. How long can he keep that up on his fuel? Well, I think he can run the, around that speed all day and uh, with, the, with the mileage that we have to get. And, uh, of course, the whole track may slow down a little bit because of the heat. No, no fuel problems at that speed, though? I don't think so. Okay, there's a story on the leader. Back to you, Jim. All right, Chris, thank you. The yellow's still out here. If we get many more of these yellows, it could be a problem on fuel and wear and everything else. There are the standings, though, on Gaius and Sneva, John Cock, Rutherford, and Unser. With the yellow out, we'll take a break. Ken Norton versus Larry Holmes, Friday, June 9th, the WBC Heavyweight Championship. Ken Norton defends his WBC title against Larry Holmes. And later in June, one of golf's most prestigious events, the United States Open Golf Championship on ABC. We return to the 1978 Indianapolis 500, exclusive same-day coverage by ABC Sports. This is Jim McKay with Jackie Stewart, and they're still under the yellow flag in the early going here. Danny Ungaius, the leader in the black car, number 25. There he is in second place. That red, white, and blue car, number one, of Tom Sneva, who was the USAC national champion last year on a season-long basis. But here comes the green flag. They're racing again. Ungaius, the leader. Look at Sneva, Jackie. And Sneva's really picked it up there. You know, he was in the right gear at the right time. He was obviously looking at the light system that goes all the way around the racetrack, and he got the jump on Danny Ungaius. Danny must have been slightly asleep there, but he's not letting it pass at that. But Tom Sneva has taken the lead of the Indy 500. Okay, Ungaius, however, as you see, very close to him. This is really beautiful motor racing right now at speeds of over 185 miles an hour. On the straightaway, remember, it's well over 200. Oh, they're getting up to close to 230 miles an hour there. Danny and Guy is tucked in behind Tom Sneva. A slower car there. That Salt car Walter. number 77, Salt Walters, raising his arm to look as if he was raising his fist in back, but certainly not to the drivers behind him. I wonder if he sees Tom Sneva behind him there as he goes in. And he doesn't see Tom Sneva because he really shut the door on Tom Sneva going through there. All right, Sneva being slowed down there, and Ungaius moving up right behind him. Ungaius moving down, tr trying to retake the lead from Tom Sneva, and he's done it. And Danny Ungaius really turned up the turbo there. He really turned up the boost, got a lot more horsepower into that engine, and it's taken over the lead once again. And even in those few short yards, look at the gap that he's got there. He's really opened it up. That's Danny Ungaius-style racing. We've seen him do that time and again. Tremendously hard, tough charge racing driver he really is amazing what an amazing young man he is he's very quiet he hardly says a word but my goodness does he drive he certainly does can you charge at indianapolis for 500 miles however that might be a question well i don't know i think if there's anyone can do it he is the black horse and the black car okay 
Moving up on yet another slower car is Danny Ungayas, and that might give Sneva another opportunity. Sneva, whoop, right in behind him. They really had a are, notion, but didn't do it. They really are carving around there. That's the main street, that's the back street at 3,300 feet there. And here you see Salt Walter, who's come into the pit there. Again. Yep. Salt Walter in the pits for the second time early in the going of this 1978 Indy 500. The leaders remaining the same, Ungaius, followed by Sneva, and they're in traffic. There is the black car, the leader, right now, moving, threading his way through cars. This in Indianapolis is a very difficult thing because the traffic, even though it looks slower, is still going very fast indeed. You've got to anticipate the driver in front of you. The driver in front is not always looking at his, at his mirrors and you must always respect that likelihood so you can never take the chance of thinking that he knows where you are. Okay, he continues to pass slower cars. On Gaius and Sneva, then Johncock, Rutherford and Unser, the three former winners of the race, still lurking back there and a long, long way to go. Breathing down the necks of the younger, less experienced driver. Look at here at Gaius, who doesn't really know these super speedways as well as the Taskmasters, but still seems to be adapting very, very well indeed. Now there's A.J. Foyt right now with Mario Andretti right behind him. They are 12th and 13th in the standings at this point, having moved well up. Foyt moved up from 20th place, but Andretti moved up from dead last from 33rd place, so he's going faster than AJ. What a gruesome twosome they are, really <laughs> chargers. Both of them drive very well. Mario Andretti tucking himself in there, setting up AJ Foyt to get him at the end of the straight, I'm sure, and slingshots him through, getting into turn three there. Mario Andretti passes AJ Foyt on the track. Okay, remember we're trying to keep an eye on these cars that started near the back of A.J. Foyt and Bobby Unser who started in the seventh row of Mario Andretti who had to start dead last because he was not here last weekend to qualify his own car. You saw just a small portion of this huge crowd, by the way, then. It's all the way around the racetrack, remember? About 250,000 of them see, see another 100,000 or more standing around. And standing around at the moment, Salt Walker. He is very upset. Well, it's not often that a man gets out of his racing car and gets back in again, so it may be the end of the day for Salt Walter. Okay, we'll keep tabs on that one too. As Danny Ungaia still continues to have no problems. He's fast, he charges, but he's very smooth with it too, Jack. Incredibly smooth, and this is the key to the door in Indianapolis because you've got to be smooth. You've got to drive around there almost at the edge of a razor blade. You can't afford to slip or slide the car. If you do that, you get your tire temperatures very hot. The car then does not handle so well. You can't afford to scrub any speed off in the corners, so therefore you've got to drive it with great finesse. Oh, Mario Andretti coming into the pits now. He had just passed A.J. Foyt, remember. He looks like he's going to be short. He's, oh, he's, he's way on the road. He's in the wrong pit, and he's got his hands up and disgusted himself. The engine stopped. He stalled his engine. Mario Andretti, what a terrible error. He's passing the point of AJ points now. How in the world can he do that? Oh, it's just a terrible error. He obviously thought it was his pit and he's being pushed up. This is an enormous amount of time lost. All that great time that he's gained on the racetrack has been lost now down there in the pit lane. Because this is all under the green flag and the other cars are still lapping 180 to 185 miles an hour. Look at Mario. Looks like he's saying, oh, goodness his hand on his head how could he do a thing like that the man who may well win the 1978 world grand prix formula one drivers championship one of the great drivers of our time the former winner of this race in 1969 born in italy raised in nazareth pennsylvania made his mark in american racing first but then went back to the land of his birth to italy and other countries in europe and around the world to try to win that world championship he's still after but look at the seconds going by jackie there's something wrong there they're looking at the back of the car this is not a scheduled pit stop okay the pit stops all important here let's see how they work jackie in the Indy race, a pit stop could win or lose the race for the driver. In this case, Mario Andretti is in the pits, a demonstration with his team. The regulations at Indy state that only five men are allowed over the wall to work in the car. Here you see the air jack, a Penske invention, being put into action. The jacks lift the car up by air pressure. This means that nothing can slip. Here you see the fuel line and the overflow tank being put into place. Then you see a wheel being loosened off by the air tool. 
the rear wheel is taken off, put into place by somebody else, and then the air tool put back into position again, and of course the car dropped back onto the racetrack. Here you see in our split screen, the rear wheel on the left, being taken off by one man, being put on by another. In the front wheel, one man does the entire operation, of course using an air tool in both ends of the car. Then the car is dropped back on again. These jacks you can see working there, the air tool comes out and the jack gets dropped back onto the ground. No damage risk of the car with a manual jack. Then the fuel line and the overflow tank is taken out and the car is pushed away. Tremendously fast work, real synchronised precision at Indianapolis. A 14 second pit stop would be what they would be looking for and this is really what could be winning or losing the race. Remember this, there'll be about 10 pit stops in Indianapolis. For every second lost on the track, it's almost the length of a football field, a real rush. Of course, that was a demonstration earlier. The pit stop didn't work that way this time with Andretti stopping way short of his own pit, now having major problems and out of the car. And there is Tom Sneva into the pits. Tom Sneva, he's, he's obviously very concerned. He's got to get out and look at that, an 11.3 pit stop. Just as we said in the demonstration, 14 is fast, but 11 is very fast. That is much more normal Roger Penske team pit stop. Chris Economaki, our man in the pits, as you watch Angaius lead. Chris? What's wrong with it, and can they fix it? Well, he's quiet. He's very disappointed. There's a problem there with the... It appears to be a very silent about it all, and I can't say as I blame him. All right, Chris. Mario, normally very cooperative. As you say, you can't blame him under these circumstances. Danny Angaius, the leader in the race, and... Uh, Steve, of course, has pitted. That gave Angaius a chance to go out in front, but he's going to have to pit very soon, obviously. He obviously will be concerning himself with that. They're still running under the, the green light, so therefore he's getting as much space on the racetrack as he possibly can. Danny Angaius being informed by, hopefully, his radio and, of course, the pit signals that he gets as what's going on with the rest of the pattern in the race. And look at that. He's raising his hand. He's coming into the pits. He raises his bright orange glove as he comes off of turn four. So that no car behind is going to be mixed up with him going that little bit slow. He's coming down the pit lane very quickly in detail. It certainly is, as he does at all times. You might make the point too, Jackie, that you can't just go as fa fast as you want all the way here. Because you are only allowed so much fuel for the entire day. And if you go too fast, you have too much boost, you use it up and you won't have any. Look, Spike Gell has it up against the wall. Car number 19 against the wall. Look at the, uh, the right front wheel. Just about torn off the car, Spike getting out. I don't, of course, you can't see an alcohol fire, but he, no, he's taking his time. Looks like there's no fire. You wouldn't see it if there was, but by his actions. Well, he's got out the racing car. He's obviously all right. There's no damage to Spike Gelhausen. But look at this. Danny Ongaius is still in the pits. This is a very long pit stop for Danny Ongaius. Much longer than anticipated, but remember, he's under the yellow. Look at this replay again. The car runs along the wall. He's very lucky that that front wheel there against the wall has not come back and probably hit him. This can often happen at Indianapolis. He's a very lucky man. The wheel stayed on. The car did not in any way risk getting itself up in two wheels or turn over. No damage to the car or the driver in the serious sense, but the car is certainly badly damaged. Oh, but look at this. Tom Sneva has taken the lead on Gaius. Came in under the green before the yellow came out. Again, we return to the Indy 500 of 1978. We're still under the yellow light here. There's Tom Sneva leading the race just behind him. Danny Ungaius, who is in second place. Then it's John Cox, Mears, and Hunter. Let's go down to Chris Economaki again. Mario Andretti is back on the track after a seven-minute pit stop to replace what they call the black box. It's part of the transistorized ignition system. One thing about transistorized ignition, the extreme heat does affect it, and this may have been the reason this particular part failed on the car. It's very hot. He may have a very fast race car for the rest of the race. He may have more trouble. One fortuitous circumstance did take place, though. The yellow flag came out, and he only lost seven laps. All right, Chris, you can see, I believe, by the beads of perspiration on Chris's brow that it's mighty hot down there. The temperature just 85 degrees, but extremely humid. Now, there's Rick Myers into the pits. He just took off his neck brace deal there. And the car, the car's on fire at the back. There's the fire in the wing there. They're pushing the car away. The engine stalled. Rick Mears had been pushed back on. The collar that they were fitting to Rick Mears must have come undone because when he came into the pits, he took it off and gave it to his pit crew. They did something to it, fitted it back into his his neck again and he was able to get back on the racetrack under those yellows as you can see the yellow with Pat Fidan holding it is still on the racetrack. All right the yellow's still up but we have information Jackie that Steve Krisloff took the lead there a moment ago under the yellow however 
for taking the lead, for having violated just now, USAC tells us, having violated the pacer light rule, which you explained a while ago, Krisilov has been penalized one lap. Instead of re leading the race, he's been pushed way back a full lap behind the leaders. Well, there was, some, specu there was some speculation, Jim, whether they would be able to police this correctly, but it looks like we've had a green. Yes, yes and look at this, Ungaius, right behind Steve. It looked like he was going to try to pass him, but now he drops in behind him. Tom Steve the leader still. Well, last time, of course, Tom Steve got the jump on Danny Ungaius, and Ungaius was trying to get his own back, but it just shows here the USAC officials are right on top of the job because that yellow light situation, they've actually policed it, and that's a fairly stiff penalty, a one-lap penalty to Chrysalov. Extremely close dangerous but masterful racing right now between two of the top race drivers in the world, Danny Ungaius and Tom Sneva. Sneva, the pride of the great Northwest, Ungaius born in Hawaii, more recently living in Costa Mesa, California. Oh, look at this! Ungaius down low! And he really is he's charging it. by. He's got it. He's taking Woo. it from Tom Steve. What an enormous surge oh. of power these cars have when they turn that boost up. It's a remarkable performance. It just kicks you in the back and that car really goes. And Gaius seems to be more liberal with his boost pressure and giving himself more horsepower. I wonder if he's all right for fuel because remember this is a 500 mile race and they're only allowed a certain amount of fuel. If you waste it all too early, it could cost you dearly at the end of the race. Well, there must be all sorts of mixed emotions in the Penske pits right now. One of their men in second place battling for the lead, but the two others having problems. Andretti in for a seven minute pit stop that got some seven laps. Rick Mears in having an engine on fire. Seems to have other problems, but one man still competitive. Well, Roger Penske is a masterful organizer of men and of cars and the machines, and of course he does a great job. I think the fact that he's got three cars in this this race is, of course, a very difficult thing to handle. But there's there's uh, Steve Chrysalov right. there. He's back in eighth position, which must be very disappointing for him because he's been docked one lap because of that penalty. Okay, a tough break for Steve Chrysalov of New Jersey. Let's go down to Bill Fleming. He's with Salt Walther in their pits. beginning today what happened i've you know I've, I've always taken all the excuses and i've said our team goof and i've always covered up for a cheap mechanic but if anyone gets it this year it's tommy smith i ran 198 in this car in practice and i ran 197 in practice and getting ready to qualify and tommy changed the entire throttle system last night the night before a race and only an idiot would do that either he goes or i'm going with another team right off the bat the throttle system wide open going into one i had to stand on the brakes he puts new brakes in the car and we're going down for the first lap you just don't do it the best team I've ever had. We selected them. They've done a great job. Tommy should have been let go, and I'm not making any excuses, and I'm not driving. We're going to stay here. Today, Walt is going to go out. At the end of the race, we're going to be there. So I'm not quit. We're going to be there. You're not going to fire him yet, then? Huh? You're not going to fire him yet, after the race? No, Tommy's not working on the car anymore. It's not, it's not a such thing as firing. I begged the man. I've put up with him since 1972. He won't listen. You don't make changes the night before a race. You just don't do it. I talked to six top drivers. They do not do it, but he does. Absolutely incense Salt Walter, and we understand Tommy Smith has left the pit, although they're still working on the car, and is picking up his gear in Gasoline Alley and is going to leave the racetrack. Well, Salt Walter's certainly an angry man. If he had his throttle stick open going into turn one and he locked his brakes up, that's no comfortable sensation. But look at Danny Ongaius trying to get past that other car there. The other car certainly did not know that, and it, it's Roger McCluskey, who's a right. very experienced driver car number 11 there, but he was really chopping off Danny there, obviously not aware of Danny's presence, but there, of course, on the main street where there's a lot more road to spare, Ungaius gets through and gets past. Okay, so Danny Ungaius is still the leader in the race. Tom Sneva is second. I'm still quite surprised at the statement of Salt Walter. I've never heard a man so publicly irate during a race. Now we've got a yellow again. We've got a yellow. No, there's no crash, no spin. They say there is some sort of debris on the track. Well, let's go now to a native Hoosier, a man who really knows Indianapolis, my ABC colleague, Chris Schenkel. Chris is in ABC Scoring Central. Let's get a report from him now. Okay, Chris. Well, there is a searing heat here in the month of May at Indianapolis, but no one's as hot as Salt Walther. What a battle between Ongaius and Sneva, the two men to qualify the fastest. Form is holding true, but there are six cars now out of the race, and let's take a look 
at their names and the reason that they're out. Cliff Husel, the 29-year-old Canadian, is out because of an oil on malfunction. First one out in the fourth lap. Sheldon Kenzer, 35-year-old native of Bloomington, Indiana. Oil pressure problems. Jerry Sneever, brother of the pole sitter. Uh, rear end failure on the 18th lap. And Phil Threshy, at 25, is the youngest rookie in the field of five rookies. And he did complete 18 laps before he had an oil pressure malfunction. So you see, it's not because of the heat. These are mechanical malfunctions. Tom Bagley now, the 38-year-old rookie, has completed 25 laps but uh, began overheating. And you saw Spike Gelhausen hitting the wall, the native Hoosier wrecking on the 23rd lap in his second Indianapolis 500. He was last a year ago. He was taken to the field hospital. We called our friend Dr. Tom Hanna. He has a sprained left foot. So, and Gaius in the lead with Sneva second. We'll be back with more racing at Indy, but first this. A World Super Featherweight Championship. WBC champion Alexis Arguello defends his title against Diego Alcala. Saturday on ABC's Wide World of Sports. We return to ABC Sports exclusive same-day coverage of the 1978 Indianapolis 500. There's A.J. Foyt in car number 14. He's been lapped by the race leader, Danny Angaius. And uh, although he moved up very quickly on the first lap that we saw, there's Angaius ahead of him right now in the black car number 25. And there is, uh, that's uh, the scoring table in the, in the bit of Angaius, I believe. Right. There is Danny, but A.J. Foyt, as we said, is now going much slower than he was at the beginning of the race. He's having problems. There are the standings on Gaius and Sneva, then that group of John Cock, Rutherford and Unser. Danny Ungai is still the race leader. He's still as smooth as ever. He's still getting around this speedway, threading the needle, because that's what it amounts to there. He has to be so clean, so smooth, so precise. And this is what Angaius, I think, has surprised so many people by doing, because they thought he was one of those rushing heroes who would get the car sideways, who would do quite well at the shorter, slower tracks, but not so well in these super speedways. There he gets a plus three seconds on the second man. That gives him some indication. He normally works with the radio, but generally they also work with a pit board to try and keep as much peace and quiet in the cockpit of the driver as possible to try and avoid distraction of any kind. But he has stretched that lead to three seconds now over second place Tom Sneva. Moving up now on Johnny Rutherford. Now there is Sneva going past A.J. Boyd. So A.J. being passed by the first two cars. He's well, all up now. That means that he's being passed and lapped by Tom yep. Sneva. It's not a normal thing to see A.J. Boyd being lapped on any racetrack. I don't think we can expect to see a great deal from him today because obviously his car is not performing as well as it normally does. You know, uh, let me ask you a layman's question. The young guy is experienced to a great extent. Look at him try it. Quite past Johnny Rutherford now, the former two-time winner of the race was in drag racing where they go a quarter of a mile straight ahead can you really learn that much wait i'm going to ask you that again in a minute because you have to go down to chris economaki in the pits now with parnelli jones okay here's parnelli jones again what's the trouble with danny's radio and how serious is it well it just uh, isn't working right at the moment uh, or it doesn't seem to we are not be able to get any communication so we just have to go back to the backup setup which is the board. Now what's that going to do to his ability to run and uh, be competitive, fuel and all that, using the boost? Well, that's uh, that's no problem. Uh, we can give him them kind of uh, 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 readings on the board. But uh, the biggest problem is uh, if he's having a particular hard time with the chassis or something out there and he wants to change a tire during the pit stops, it would be difficult for him to tell us. On the last stop, Parnelli, you didn't change tires. Everyone else did. Why was that? Well, we changed on the first one, and that's uh, one of the reasons we had such a long pit stop on the first stop. We changed one, and uh, they didn't get it on the pins, and uh, they had to jack it back up and put it on the pins. Making up for lost ground, huh? Well, we were having a little trouble uh, with the chassis, so we changed them in the first pit stop, and that's one of the reasons that we didn't have to change the second time. Okay, what's he say about how the car is running now? Well, we think it's running well. I mean, we're leading, and uh, we're getting the mileage, so that's, uh, that's what counts. Okay, even with the radio not working, Parnelli Jones is smiling in Danny on Gaia's pit. Okay, Parnelli Jones, former winner of the Indianapolis 500, now team manager for Ongaius. What I asked you, Jackie, was, 
can learn anything about racing when you're drag racing, which is just straight ahead for a quarter of a mile. Well, you don't have to go around many corners, but of course, <laughs> you've got to be very delicate with the steering. And of course, what we're seeing at Indianapolis is a great deal of delicacy. I think Danny Ongaius's basic talent of driving a racing car was in the seat of his pants right from the beginning. Whether it was drag racing, motorcycling, or this kind of racing, obviously the man has a gift that God has given him. And my goodness, he's using it to good effect. It certainly is, at these tremendous speeds here at Indianapolis. Remember the cars going faster again this year in qualifying. Of course, we've had a couple of yellows, so the race speed, the average speed is down now because the race is under the yellow count there also. And of course, they're only going 80 miles an hour at that point. Danny Ongaius, still the leader. Danny, number one, ABC2. Okay, let's go to Chris Economaki about fuel. Again, one of the more interesting stories on pit road is the fuel situation. The sanctioning United States Auto Club has allocated 285 gallons to each entrant, 40 in the car and 245 in the pit side fuel tank when the race gets underway. But with turbochargers on these cars, they can pump many gallons more through the engine unless they can serve. Each driver has a boost control knob in his cockpit that controls turbocharger pressure and thereby engine horsepower. He has to use it rather sparingly to get the 500 miles in. Now then, if there is too much fuel used in the latter stage of the race, he's going to have to turn his knob way down. But on the other hand, if he's conservative, at the end of the race, he can turn that knob and get maybe even a thousand horsepower out of his engine. Then there's the case of the yellow flags. The yellow flags slow down the race, build up a fuel reserve. This gives the driver a chance to turn that knob up a little bit more and be, as they say, more racy. It makes for an interesting competition. Between the many pit stops, the fuel is measured on this incremental gauge here, and the crews use handheld calculators to figure out just how much fuel is left. They then tell their driver on the two-way radio how much boost he can have and how racy he can be. A very interesting explanation, videotaped earlier by Chris Economaki on the fuel situation here. So it's a combination of brave men and deep science going on here. Well, they're certainly working with science nowadays in motor racing. There's Danny Ongaius, who you saw from his pit signal there, had been lapping at 188 miles an hour and was plus four seconds in the lead. This information, very vital to him now because, as Parnelli Jones pointed out, his two-way radio system is not working and this could be very detrimental to Danny Ongaius. So now his pit signals are of major importance. Just a few years ago, that's the only way you got the information here or anywhere else. But the radios, as you said, have become extremely important in the Indianapolis 500. There's still a long way to go. One guy is the leader, Steva second, and then John Cock. We'll be back for more of our coverage. Again, we return to Indianapolis, and there are the current standings. On guy is still leading over Sneva. Then Al Unser has moved up into third place, ahead of Gordon Johncock, with Bobby Unser now in fifth. Remember, he started way back in seventh position. Those are the standings at the moment. The Indianapolis 500 is being brought to you by Goodyear. When we race, you win. By Fram, makers of oil, air, and fuel filters, windshield wipers, and Autolite spark plugs. By the Coca-Cola Company and all the people who bring you the bright, refreshing taste of Coca-Cola. Coke adds life to just about everything you do. And by Toyota. Toyota hopes you enjoy today's race. You asked for it, and you got it. And what you got is really something with much more to come. We're going to take a break, but we'll return with more of the Indianapolis 500 after this from our local station. Again, we return to the Indianapolis 500. Jim McKay here with Jackie Stewart in our commentary booth, and there are the standings. Danny Ungayas, Tom Sneva, Al Unser in third now, Gordon Johncock, and Bobby Unser. So the two Unsers have moved into the top five. There is the race leader in the black car number 25 of the Interscope Racing Team. Organized by Ted Field, the team manager, however, is Parnelli Jones, whom you've seen, a former winner of the Indianapolis 500. Danny Guy is getting round there, and of course this very, very hot day indeed, it's having its toll mechanically, it's also having its toll in tyres. We heard one or two of the teams complaining that the car was beginning to handle not too well. They came in and put fresh tyres on, and this is of course not an abnormal thing. You see Tom Sneva there, the car number one, the USAC champion at the present time. On Guy is really smooth, and of course the same could be said of Sneva. But moving right behind uh, Sneva is Al Unser, not behind him, moving now right ahead of him. And Al Unser had lurked back there in fifth place, he got up to third and now has moved into second place. Into the pits, Gordon Johncock, remember, he had been third. This is the team led by George Vignati. A little close up of uh, Gordy Johncock, former winner of the race. 
That was in the terrible year of 1973 when it took three rains marred, tragedy marred days to complete the race. Good pit stop. 12.8 is a very good pit stop indeed, and you see the traffic jam coming in and out of the pits there now. The car's rushing down this wide pit lane here. You can see the mechanics waving to their drivers. Car Alan number two, Alan, sir. The car now run by Jim Hall of Chaparral, the tall Texan, a very quiet, unassuming man. You see Alan, sir, there, a man of great experience, twice an Indy winner. He's pointing down at the rear tyre to have that checked. And look at that, an 11.1 second pit stop. What a terrific time. A new crew to Indy this year. Wonderful. All of the leaders coming in for pit stops under the green. And under the green is where every tenth of a second actually counts. There is Ungaius still out on the racetrack, the leader in the race. He probably will have to be coming in. Of course, he might hope for a yellow right about now. That would be a big break for him. It's an amazing thing for Ungaius because he seems to have been turning the boost up more than anyone else, and yet he's still out on the racetrack longer than anyone else. So maybe they've got some sort of secret with regards to their fuel consumption. And there you have it. One lap, pit one. And that means that Danny Ungaius has got one more lap to go around this two and a half mile speedway to come into the pits and be refueled. Incidentally, you can literally see the humidity here on some of our shots. If you see how it shimmers, it's extremely humid, 85 degrees, but it feels much hotter. Now Tom Sneva, who had led the race, then was second, now was third before the pit stop started, is into the pits. He had to be pushed back a little bit there because he's got to be exactly in the right place to take on the fuel because that fuel line has got too long. They're not changing any rubber on the car. It's a long pit stop, in fact, for no rubber. It's 13.8 seconds, so therefore he's lost a little bit on Al Unser, of course. And there and here comes Ongaius into the pits. Danny Ongaius coming into the pits very fast indeed. Look how he's catching that other car in. Okay, Ongaius takes a quick left turn into his pit. He, he really goes fast as long as he can. There he is. Danny Ongaius in car number 25. That looks pretty good so far. They'll be getting, oh, he's gesturing for something. The car's pushing, the car's understeering, he's saying. The car's going straight on in the corners instead of turning round. Let's meet this young man up close and personal. I was born in Hawaii. I enjoyed it very much. <clears throat> and yet I have uh, to owe mostly what has happened to me in uh, motorsports to the fellows that I uh, spent the last half of my life with in California. I uh, got to race motorcycles, as uh, most of the young men do today, because uh, something that you can become involved in at a very low cost. I did that uh, partially while I was in Hawaii, and there were some uh, very good people there who helped me to do it and uh, to do quite well at it. Well, for motorcycles, I was involved with uh, just some fellows who uh, we happened along with every day and they were involved in drag racing and uh, one day I got to drive one of their cars and along the way I met somebody else who uh, was involved in drag racing and when I moved here gave me the opportunity to uh, start with a car that had previously or the year before been the national champion and with the fellow who had uh, worn that crown and so I had good equipment and some good help uh, immediately and uh, that helped uh, very much. Danny was asked what interest he has other than racing. What, we asked him, does he do with his spare time? Well, I do about the same thing that the uh, anybody would do every day. I enjoy swimming, I have uh, enjoyed building model airplanes, I uh, like riding motorcycles, uh, just generally getting off and doing something different. Danny Ungaius is self facing race driver. Right now, however, he has been eclipsed by Al Unser because that slow pit stop caused Danny Ungaius the lead. Al Unser, who had been fit not many laps to go, has now taken the lead in the Indianapolis 500. This car, number 25, is now second. There's Bobby Unser into the pits. Now, he moved into fourth place while the others were making their pit stop, but he will probably drop back to fifth as he makes his own pit stop under the green. It was a good one, though. Bobby Unser... Uh, driving for the team led by Dan Gurney, who himself is a driver, finished second place here. There's Janet Guthrie, by the way, the only woman ever to drive in Indianapolis. Last year she had very bad luck, but this year she is currently, as you saw, running ninth in the race. A very admirable showing by Janet Guthrie to this point. And there she is in and out again. She's not making the lightning-fast pit stops of some of those other teams. 
but her idea is simply since she threw away a little plastic bottle and she was having a drink out of that's all that that was so look who's in the lead Alonso. he's won this race twice before back-to-back -back victories in 1970 and 71 he used to drive for Parnelli Jones's team until this year now he's taken the lead from Angaias who now drives for Parnelli Jones the race up to this point was a race between Angaias and Tom Steven, but suddenly it is Unser, followed by Angaias and Steven, and Bobby Unser and John Cobb. A lot more to come. Stay with us. Coasting on the race course into the pits is A.J. Foyt. It looks like this will not be the day for A.J. He's furious. I don't know whether it's with himself, his pit crew, or his car, or a combination of all three. But there he is coming in. He's running at the moment eighth in the race, which is just one place ahead of Janet Guthrie. He would not, I'm sure, like to finish behind the lady at Indianapolis. He looks However, as if he's run out of fuel, Jim. As he came in there, there was water poured over A.J. He seemed a little surprised by that, but it looked like he had maybe run out of fuel and therefore was coasting in that little bit in towards the pit lane. It certainly has cost him time. Okay, A.J. Foyt at the moment, though, the center of attention, as he is when anything happens to him here. A very long pit stop for the man from Houston, Texas. He's won the race four times, very furious. He cares so much. Let's beat him a little bit up close and personal while we have a moment. The name of A.J. Foyt is synonymous with speed and success. A.J. has become a living legend in the American racing scene. He guards his privacy selfishly, living closely to his family and a very few chosen friends. Motor racing has been kind to A.J. Foyt, but it's also crammed his life. This, for example, is his 21st year at Indy. He's become national champion six times, and he's won this great race four times. But there is a very private side to A.J. Foyt. His home is tucked away in two acres of trees and bushes in the quiet memorial district of Houston, Texas. The family Foyt have lived in this house for six years. It is filled with many mementos the trappings of victory that few people could equal. From his longtime friend and car owner, Jim Gilmer, this image of the famous car number 14 IndyCar, for once not in Coyote Orange. Aside from the race driver, there's a country boy lurking deeply with an A.J. Foyt. On the A.J. Foyt Ranch, 350 acres, which lies 30 miles outside of Houston, most of the work is done by the man himself, A.J. Foyt is no gentleman farmer. Let's listen to his thoughts about the ranch. It's actually some place I can go and get away, and I enjoy working out in the pastures and you know, mowing grass and things like that. And I just enjoy the outdoor life. And every chance I get, I have a chance to go out there, either paint fences, build fences, or barns, or what have you. Uh, like everything you see there, I've built uh, about 75% of it myself. Uh, and to me, uh, this is relaxation. That's the reason I don't have nobody there really working. Just uh, when I'm going out of town, I have somebody there to guard the place, and uh, that's about it. Now you're into horses, and this seems to me that it's almost a second generation of A.G. Foyt. That's well, quite true. My sons had show horses when actually he was going to high school, and uh, I figured we was going to have horses since I've always been race-minded that uh, I'd like to have race horses. And uh, it's been a great relaxation. I've really enjoyed studying the pedigrees and, you know, just seeing what we come up with. We have between 20 and 25 horses, uh, usually at the tracks and then at the farm. Uh, you know, we're raising some, and uh, we've probably got another 25 to 30 there, plus uh, 10 or 15 broodmares. If there was to be a fairy godmother come along and wave a magic wand and say, A.J. Foyt, you can win your fifth Indy or you can win the Kentucky Derby. What would you say? I'd have to go to the fifth Indy, Jackie. Uh, to me, this is probably the biggest sport in the world. It means an awful lot to me. And I'd have to say horses are still secondary to my automobile racing. I love racing, and uh, I really had no intention of retiring, not for the next two or three years, really. The equestrian fraternity will have to wait a few more years for the undivided attention of one A.J. Foyt, the racer. So don't be too surprised as A.J. pulls out of the pits here if one day in the not-too-distant future he tries for the double, the Derby and Indy, in one month of May. It just could happen. A.J. back after that long pit stop, however, is lagging this year. It doesn't look like he's going to win it. Al Unser is the leader in the 1978 Indianapolis 500. He's won it twice before, driving for a brand new race team, remember, organized by Jim Hall of Texas, who was a 
uh, a sports car driver himself in the 60s. He and Phil Hill used to drive the Chaparral cars. Jim Hall invented the wing. It was a movable wing at that time, but it led to the wings on all these race cars today that enable them to stick to the racing surface at these speeds of over 200 miles an hour. An amazing man, Jim Hall. Texas has been very successful. I drove for Jim Hall on one occasion. I also right. drove for another Texan right here. Uh, John Meekham and he was successful he won Indianapolis and my goodness here we see another one leading the race and of course A.J. Foyt comes from that small state there is Janet Guthrie by the way still run, running up in the top 10 of the race still behind A.J. Foyt but not too far behind him Unser and Angaius, John Cox, Sneva and Unser Bobby Unser, those are the standards the Pirates battle the Phillies the Giants take on the Astros and the Orioles meet the Tigers Check local listings for ABC's Monday Night Baseball. We've passed the halfway mark in the 1978 Indianapolis 500. You're watching ABC Sports exclusive same day coverage of the race. Into the pitch, the race leader, Al Unser. And that means right now, Danny Ungaius has taken the lead again. He's still out there. Well, there's Al Unser, and there you see the clock running. The last time Al Unser came into the pits, it was 11.1 seconds, and look at the precision there, 11.2. These are the fastest pit stops I've seen so far, and it's almost a race as he leaves the pits there with the backup car of A.G. Point behind the trip by George Snyder. He retakes onto the racetrack. And Angaius again is the leader in the race. You mentioned, by the way, that you drove for Jim Hall, the leader of Al Unser's team here, Jackie. You drove another invention of his that they call the vacuum cleaner. That's it was right. great, but they outlawed it, right? Well, he's been a great in inventor in his own way. And there, by the way, you see in the pits there, you've got the Tom Sneva the car. Yes, he's in with the clock running there also. Let's see if the Penske bid are up to the demonstration they did for us. And, of course, the competition, he's long nope. past the time of Al Unser, 13.6 seconds with a slightly slow takeaway there by Tom Sneva. We were speaking of Jim Hall, and he brought in the vacuum cleaner, they called it. It sucked here from underneath the car, and it really was a great invention at the time. And then, as you say, it was outlawed by the international body, the governing body of motorsport. But right now, the outlaw in the black brick is Danny Ongaius, and he's heading for pit lane as well. Again, he has his hand in the air. Of course, we see a vestige of that vacuum cleaner in the skirts that we see on the Indianapolis cars and on the Formula One Grand Prix cars. But the man of the moment, Danny Ongaius, now will lose the lead in the race, of course, as Al Unser will flash by and retake it. And Danny Ongaius pit there. Pan Ali Jones, look at him asking there how he's doing. He's putting his hand to see if he cocks his hand to the left and pushes it. It means that he's that he's getting understeer. And there, number two takes the lead. That's your leader now, Al Unser, on the racetrack as Danny Ongaius leaves the, the pits. Obviously, this radio defect is certainly happening hampering the information that Danny Ungais is giving to his crew because when he comes into the pit like that he really has to tell them what's wrong with the car to try and make it grip the track that little bit better. Everything seems to be working perfectly though for this car number two. Entered by Jim Hall, remember, driven by Al Unser of the racing Unser's from Albuquerque, New Mexico. He's won the race twice, his brother Bobby's won it twice, they're the only brothers ever to have won it. And there you see, and there's oh. Rick Mears. Rick Mears has pulled right off the racetrack, car number 71. What a shame for the man who sat in the front row there, a rookie. Very disappointing, the car smoking at the back there. It was not a spin or anything, however. He just pulled off the racetrack. Uh, something wrong with his engine, so it has not caused any problems with the other cars. It was not an accident of any sort. He just pulled off. The yellow is out, however. He must have dropped some oil. Again, let's check in with our ABC colleague in our scoring central, Chris Schenkel. Here we are, Chris. So we're in our seventh yellow flag. We have only 20 racers going at the moment, 13 out. And here are the latest six. Let's take a look at them. John Mailer, 41-year-old native of Iowa, timing gear failure. Roger McCluskey, 17th 500, out because of gearbox failure. Pancho Carter, coming back after an incredible accident. So only six months ago, gearbox malfunction. Rick Mears, whom you just saw on the grass, well, he had an engine failure after 104 laps. Larry Dixon, the 39-year-old native of Marietta, Ohio, he had oil pressure problem. And the sixth, making a total of 13 now out of the race, Tom Bigelow, 38 years old, five-time starter, lost a connecting rod on the 104th lap. We've had five lead changes. It's been exciting with Ungas leading 71 laps, Unser 39, and Snita 7, with an average speed of 156. You know, all of this year are missing a tremendous man who uh, built the house of Hullman 34 years ago. Tony Hullman, 
philanthropist, sportsman, and business giant. He died in October of 1977. Tony Holman was somebody special. Everybody who ever came in contact with Tony Holman misses this gentle man from Indiana, who first attracted attention as an outstanding athlete at Worcester Academy and Yale University. Tony was a 1924 graduate of Yale, an All-American end on the 1923 football team, which he also captained, a world-class track and field star. Tony was a big man who never lost touch with the little man. He was full of love, and he showed it. His love affair with the Indianapolis Motor Speedway began in 1945, when he and his president, Wilbur Shaw, signed the papers of ownership and began rebuilding and developing the speedway and the race into the world's greatest sports spectacle. Tony had the rare quality of combining humbleness with dignity and pride. He had great strength, gentle, but not weak. He was never too busy to relate to the famous and the not so famous. He befriended many a little man. As his friend, I know he wouldn't want me to give you a rundown on his accomplishments because he was a shy man. Tony always felt that action spoke louder than words, yet once a year in May, for 23 consecutive years, he always spoke powerful words to the 33 drivers he admired so much. And here is his command of a year ago, his last. In company with the first lady ever to qualify at Indianapolis, gentlemen, start your ringtone. You know, Tony Hullman loved the last line of a poem written by Indiana's poet laureate, James Whitcomb Riley. Mr. Riley wrote it as a tribute to a departed friend. And all of us feel this way, and it was simply this. He is not gone, he is just away. Thank you very much, Chris. We're still under the yellow here, and of course, everybody has their favorite Tony Holman story. He was truly one of the most self-effacing and yet accomplished men I've known. He was known but, around the world and respected a tremendous Excuse man. me, here's Chris. This is Howard Gilbert, A.J. Ford's engine builder. What's what's A.J. Ford's problem so far, Howard? Uh, this plane are cool. Nothing wrong. You're lapped down and just in the top ten. Yeah, we're, uh, we'll be there. <laughs> okay, a typical Foyt Pitt uh, interview. They won't admit to any problems. Uh, the, on the scoreboard, A.J. Ford has shown a ninth position, one lap down, just past the halfway mark, but confidence in the pits. Back to you, Jim. All right, we're still under the yellow in the Indianapolis 500. The leader of the race is Al Unser in car number two. There is number 20, Gordon Johncock. Still in competition in third place. So we're going to take a break while we're under the yellow and return for more coverage. There is the race leader, Al Unser, in traffic at the moment in the Indianapolis 500. And his lead, which he has started to spread a little bit on Danny and Gaius, is being cut down by that very fact. Having a little trouble moving past those cars. You can't go too quickly through traffic just in case something goes wrong because there's the signal being given plus seven seconds to Al Unser. And he's well, it had been better. And he, yes, exactly, but he has to keep an eye on these other cars. There's no point of getting yourself involved in an accident at this stage in the race. Well, that lead had been 13 seconds while we were away. It's now down to seven seconds. Chris Economaki is down with Jim Hall, the team leader for Al Unser. Let's get a report. There's Jim Hall. Okay, Chris. Okay. Hey, what a way to break in IndyCar racing, Jimmy. How's Al's fuel mileage? It's, everything's looking good right now, Chris. We're, uh, we make the end of the race running like we're going, so it looks good. Now, our guys probably got some in reserve to turn up that boost later on. How about you guys? Well, we'll see if we can run with him. Okay, Jim Hall, Alex's car owner, confident it's in his first Indianapolis 500 effort with two-time winner Al Unser. Back to you, Jim. Okay, Jim Hall, the leader of the Chaparral team, and there is their driver, Al Unser, the leader in the race. The Chaparral, by the way, is what they call a roadrunner, that little animal that scoots across the desert. You know about that, Jackie. Oh, I don't know about the deserts, but I know something of the cars because it's a Lola that he's driving, and it was a Lola that I came to Indianapolis with way back in 66 and 67, and uh, I was driving for a Texan, John Beacom, at that time, and here you have another Texan with another Lola, and my goodness, is he leading the race, too? So, Danny on guys has got a lot in his plate, and that's the car you see, car number 25, the black car there, and there you see the man there, car number two, the silver helmet, red, white, and blue, driving the Lola of Jim Hall. But you know Angaius is closing that gap. He's beginning to move on in on it's, it's 
about 5.3 seconds right now. Look at that guy is still moving up. There, going out of the picture was Unser. There, the black car, Angaius. Well, Angaius can see him, of course, and right now this is a good break for Angaius. He's behind a slower car there as he goes into turn two. Now, you watch him as he comes out of turn two. He'll gain on the slower car. He'll get the benefit of the draft on the, on the long front stretch there. Then he comes out of the slipstream or draft. He gets that slingshot. And now he's got no car between he and Alan, so the car just slipping out the screen. Yeah, Minus it. two seconds only. Two seconds, that's two lengths of a football field, but right now he's not even that much behind him because of the good break that he got there in lapping another car. So Alan so certainly will see him in his mirror now, and that's no real comfort to Alan. Sir. It certainly isn't, and we would begin to wonder if Hunter might be having a small problem because Angaius is gaining dramatically. He's been gaining about a second and a half a lap here. What it seems to me is that Angaius seems to have something up his sleeve with regards to fuel, but here's a man in the pits getting his fuel. It's, of course, Tom Sleever carrying car number one. We've got the clock on him. Tom Sleever sitting in with his glasses. Sometimes he wears contact lenses, but when they race, they've got to wear glasses just in case of an accident. The contact lens can be dangerous. He's gone out in 13.9 seconds. The Penske bit very talented. Anything under 14 seconds is a good stop. It certainly is, and this man remembers in third place in the race, and most important, still on the same lap with the leader, so don't count him out yet. There was Al Unser going by, and there's Ungaius still closing in on him. We are going to have some sensational racing here in just about a minute, it looks like. Well, they're very close together, and Gaius now obviously staking his position here, getting himself into a position where he'll be able to slingshot, hopefully, and for him, pass this car in the middle, which I think is Steve Frisloff, and he would then get up to right on the tail of Alan. So there you see him, and look at that. He really, and two laps to pit. That's to say, Alan is going to come in for fuel in only two laps, and there's on Gaius. Look how he's closed up on him as they go into turn one there. Alan knows he's got to go into the pits now. They're under the green, so the next pit stop is going to be absolutely crucial for both of those drivers. It's going to be a race in the pits with that crew. The lead, let's then two seconds now. It'll be in a matter of feet pretty soon, the way Angaius is closing in on him. There's Unser passing the slower car. Dick Simons there in car number 17. He's been having lots of trouble in and out of the pits all day. Dick Simons back on the racetrack, but well behind. And there you see them going round there as they're heading towards the pits there. Okay, Angaius getting by Dick Simon and now going out again in pursuit of his only object here. The man in front of, oh, Al Unser pit in one, and they're going to give Angaius a sign Pit and one, they're going to come in at the same time. They're this, going to come in at the same moment. This, this is really, going to be dramatic. What a tremendous thing for this enormous crowd. And look at the enormity of that crowd as our cameras pan round here, sitting more than 250,000 people. And when they come into the stands there, everybody seems to stand up and strain their neck and see these two great men. And right now, the stars of this show, in fact, will be the mechanics, the men who are going to change those tires or fill up fuel or do whatever that has to be done. Remember, of course, that Al Unser's radio is working. Danny on guys' radio is not working, so if he needs anything in the pits, he has to converse. He's got to shout at his pit crew or try to give hand signals. No easy matter, and here they come. Here they come, in together. Al Unser in front. Danny on guys right behind him. Unser will have to stop first, so on guys will have to get around him. And it looks like Al might be blocking him out a little bit, but now he's got to pull in. And Gaius flashing by. There they are, both in the pit. At split screen now, on Gaius on top, Unser on the bottom. No tire change, no tire change for either car so far. They're both sitting in there waiting for the fuel to go in very patiently. Look at this, Al Unser's pulled away with files in hand. He's now passing the still parked car of Danny and Gaius. His car's been pushed away and Gaius has certainly lost ground on Al Unser. The high efficiency of the Texas Chaparral team certainly showing itself there. A good advantage for him when such a crucial distance on the racetrack matters so much. And so the difference between them right now is not a difference in the cars at all on the racetrack. It is a difference between the pit crew. The pit crew of Jim Hall and Al Unser won that race. Will they win the big race? Will they go all the way? That's another question because there's still a good long way to go. Stay with us. We're moving towards the finish of the Indianapolis 500 and Al Unser in car number two is the race leader about to put another lap on A.J. Foyt, the only four-time winner of this race. A.J.'s not going to win it this year. Unofficially, that puts him three laps down to the lead car. No way he's going to catch up. 
Al Unser, leader in the race, going extremely smoothly. Danny Ungai is second, then Steva, John Cock, and Rutherford. No radio in Danny Ungaius' car at the moment. Let's get down to Chris Economaki, see how they're doing down there. This is the amount of fuel left in Danny Ungaius' fuel tank. 70 gallons, the gauge shows, with uh, 60 or 57 laps left in the competition. We were just down in Tom Sneva's pit, and I don't think it's telling any tales out of school. Tom doesn't have quite that much left, which means that Ungaius will have the reserve to turn up the boost and call on more horsepower in the closing stage of the race in his battle with Al Unser and perhaps Tom Sneva. Back to you, Jim. Okay, so totally that doesn't look good for Sneva, but we don't know about Al Unser yet. We don't really know what his fuel situation is. We'll see if Chris can get on and have a look at their gauge and see how they stand. There's Unser. Brother Al, the younger by four years to Brother Bobby. Well, in fact, he's got a birthday coming up. In fact, the birthday is coming up tomorrow, so right. he's sitting there leading the Indianapolis 500. What a birthday present that would be if this young man coming up to the bold age of 39 could take and be one of the few people to have three Indianapolis wins under his belt. And look at him coming out there, the oh three are best as they come down the front straight away. And, and he, he gets through there, Nick Simon in the red and the black car behind him. And Janet Guthrie just behind Simon. Janet Guthrie, however, still running very well. Uh, what? It's Danny Ungaius, smoke coming from the engine. All of a sudden, the second place car probably has had it. You oh, see that? What a disappointment when that much smoke comes out yeah. the back of a race car, Jim. It looks like it might be the end of the day. Danny Ungaius, who has driven so well, the car handles so well. Everyone doing the right job. Danny Ungaius, the such quiet and dignified man from Hawaii. Obviously got an enormous amount of disappointment there. Look at the smoke coming out. Danny's unbuckling his visor there. He's All unbuckling over. his seatbelt. And, and I think he's going to get out of the car, Jim. Uh, you saw one of the pit crew just wave his arms horizontally as, as if to indicate, cut it, it's all over, kill the engine, and the engine is already dead. Danny's, what a shame. Danny's taking his gloves off, the, the crowd beginning to clap in respect of the, the performance that he's put in, his seatbelts being unbuckled by obviously a disappointing crewman there, and Danny hands him that crash helmet. What an end, what well, sad, really. It really is. And that, that means that in the race now, Al Unser has a big fat lead, and in second place is number one. And that would be Tom Sneva. But the applause in the pit areas for this man, Danny Ungaius, out of the race. A very sportsmanlike fellow under any circumstances. There's Parnelli Jones with him. Danny does not brag in victory, he doesn't moan in defeat. The quiet man from the islands from the state of Hawaii. The only other prominent race driver I can think of who started his career out there was, interestingly, the late Peter Revson, who went to college in Hawaii and started driving an old Morgan sports car out there. But here's what happened once again to one guy. It obviously happened up between turn three and four because he's entering the, the pit lane. Sad day for him. Okay, Chris Akatamaki is down there. I don't know whether Danny will want to talk on this occasion or not. Chris? Oh, Danny, a, a superb drive, uh, great drive. You must be very disappointed. Well, uh, the idea that we've fallen out hasn't set in yet, but uh, that's how it goes, I guess. Did you enjoy that race uh, with Alan, sir? Well, it was going to begin to tighten up toward the end. It was very nice. Okay, what went wrong with the car? I have no idea. What were you going to catch, Al? I think you could have. Okay. Danny, it was a great drive. Thanks a lot for a great show. And guys, out of the race after a superb performance. Well, there he is. The quiet man from Hawaii and California, Danny and guys. What an understated way to put it. That, that racing he was doing with this man, number two. He said, well, it was very nice. Well, he, he came out with great dignity, and yep. I always admire a racing driver like that because so many other racing drivers in the heat of disappointment can show anger, can show disappointment, sometimes even tears. And Danny Ongaius' dignity, I'm sure, will be recognized by sports fans around the world for the way he conducted himself under not a pleasant experience. No question of that. There's Unser, the leader, and we begin to wonder, however, and are trying to check on his fuel supply. The only question now, it would seem, uh, unless he would blow an engine or something, would be, does he have enough fuel left in the tank in the pit to finish the race? 
Well, that's a big question under any circumstances. They're very secret, the Hall people. You know, they never let anybody see the race cars, their technical improvements or anything else, but certainly they're doing a good job so far, and I'm sure their calculations were pretty accurate, knowing Jim Hall. Well, Chris Economaki's moving down there. There, He got a look at the fuel gauge in the other pits a while ago. He has not yet been to the Al Unser pit. So we're told he, we can see he's on his way down there now. Al Unser still leading the race. And again, you can see the humidity in the air. Look at that haze and the shimmering heat. 85 and very humid. Chris, can you give us a report on that now? Oh, look at that. Okay, we saw how much fuel Danny on Gaius had left and we how much Tom Sneva had, but here they are taped over the fuel gauge so no one knows how much fuel Al Unser has left, but the pressure is off now that Danny Argyas is out of the race. He can ease down on the boost pressure. He's got over 20 seconds on Tom Sneva, but the secret here remains a secret. We just don't know, and they're not telling. Back to you, Jim. Okay. You said they were secretive, and there it was. Taped over the fuel gauge they did in the Chaparral pits. We'll be right back. While we have a moment here, I'd like to remind you that the months of June and July look just as exciting on ABC Sports as the month of May has been. For example, on Friday, June 9th, 8 o'clock Eastern Time, WBC Heavyweight Championship fight. Ken Norton, the uh, champion acknowledged by the WBC group, going against Larry Holmes. And the following week, ending up on Father's Day, June 18th, the whole weekend of coverage of the United States Open Golf Championship from Cherry Hills in Denver, Colorado. In July, my goodness, we've got the British Open Golf Championship coming by satellite and the All-Star Major League Baseball game. It's going to be quite a summer, so try to be with us as much as you can. And stay with us now for the conclusion of the Indianapolis 500 as Al Unser still leading the race and closing in on slower cars again. This year, slower cars includes A.J. Foyt. He's not too far ahead of Unser. He's already been lapped several times and may be lapped again. By the way, Gordon Johncock, the teammate of Steve Brisselov, who was penalized a lap earlier for uh, violating the Pacer light rule, Johncock has now been penalized a, la a lap. The other car on the George Bignotti managed team for running over an air hose in the pit. Well, of course, they consider this to be potentially dangerous, and this is why the penalty has been put on. George McNaughty, one of the most official, efficient men in the business, and then A.J. Foyt does get left once again by Al Unser. A.J.'s car really cannot be handling correctly, and there you see Al Unser getting a very comfortable signal, plus 30 seconds, and at this stage of the race, that's a lovely cushion, but Jim, Nothing happens in any race that allows a driver to feel the slightest element of confidence this close to the end of a race because anything can happen. Okay, A.J. Foyt, by the way, still just one place in front of Janet Guthrie. St Janet's still doing quite well in her second Indianapolis 500. Gordon Johncock, despite that penalty, however, has moved back into third place, as you see here. Steve Krisloff, his teammate, is fourth. Wally Dallenbeck, fifth. But all of those cars are two laps down. It's just Unser and Sneva on the same lap in this race. It has to be one or the other of them, barring strictly unforeseen circumstances, who's going to win the race. Al Unser. We said before he's of the racing Unsers from Albuquerque, New Mexico, a family well worth hearing a little bit about. Why don't we do that now, up close and personal? The brothers Unser are a story of the great Southwest, of a bonanza-like band of brothers who stick together even when they move from their Albuquerque homes to quiet retreats in the northern part of New Mexico. On the racetrack, they're competitors, but here they are brothers. First, Bobby, the older. Well, this is my home away from home, Chama, New Mexico, center part of the state, clear up on the north side, just 10 miles from the Colorado border. And it really marches in my way to get away from our regular life of racing, driving race cars, or promotion work, endorsement work, whatever it is. And this is a nice way. It's a working ranch, a complete working ranch, 125 acres. Have our own fishing pond, a mile of river running through the place. Awful lot of work to do, and we really enjoy it. Yes, Unser's stick together. Al, the younger brother by five years, lives just a mile down the road from his brother Bobby. I shot this bear up in Point Hope, Alaska in 1971, and... Uh, I tell you, I love to hunt and fish, and uh, I just love the outdoors. It's uh, it's really a challenge to be able to go out and uh, to go hunting, and uh, I think it's it's something that Bobby and myself really enjoy because we get away from our racing. But I'll tell you one thing: if you saw Al's bear, you can tell he shouldn't have shot that baby. This bear squares out 11 and a half foot, a whole lot bigger than Al's, and it got it a year before Al got his. 
Well, this is my pride and joy. This is a chaparral snowmobile that I designed back in 1972, and it, believe it or not, it was designed for my oldest son to race. I ran the race team for a year for the people, the chaparral, and, and this is what we came up with, and it'll run over 110 miles an hour right out here on the field. Very, very fast machine and a nice machine, and I keep it just to remind me of how much we did way back then. It was a lot of fun, and I enjoy it very much. I'll let you hear what it sounds like here. I think, as everybody probably knows, that Al drives for one team in the automobile races, and I drive for another team. So whenever we go to the racetrack, we look at each other as being two different race drivers, not as brothers, and that's the way it has to be. We've always enjoyed the snowmobiling, and to us, it's kind of a release of our energies. These, then, are the racing hunters, born to the racetrack, heirs to a racing inheritance. Uncle Louie kept entering the Pikes Peak hill climb until they finally passed an age rule to make him stop. Brother Jerry was killed at Indianapolis. Their mother, known to the circuit as Ma Munzer, cheered them on and cooked a famous dinner for the Indy drivers each year until her death. The Unsers of New Mexico. If there were no such sport as racing, it's difficult to imagine what they would have done with their lives. No question what they're doing with their lives today, however. Al is leading the race. Bobby has moved into fifth place again. Both doing very well. But the man of the hour it appears with Al Unser. This is his final pit stop. Uh, however, Sneva will pass him almost unquestionably on this pit stop. Should suddenly a yellow come out for Sneva, could be a break. It isn't quite over yet. And this is a pit stop that's enormously... He hit the tire as he came in. It seems very strange. It's a long pit stop for them. I'm afraid he could have done some damage here because it's 17.3 seconds. That is long for him. It seems to me Al Unser came into the pit far too quickly. He locked up a wheel. It seems to me that the front wing, in fact, may have brushed that front wheel. Let's see it again. As he came in, you can see that, in fact, he banged the wheel, yep. the man was down there lifting it, and there you see the contact area there. He in fact was going so fast, and there you see it hitting that wheel there. He overshot his pit, he had to be pushed back a little bit, and that was expensive. Well now here comes Steve into the pits, of course, he has to make his final pit stop, and on this one, almost unquestionably, Unser will retake the lead. Tom Steve, the leader as he comes into the pits, but now, Al Unser going back out in front, out on the racetrack. There's Roger Penske on the pit wall. Unser retaking the lead. And it's not the fastest pit stop of the day for Sneva either. Roger Penske with his stopwatch in his hand there, telling him to hold. He's speaking to him on the two-way radio while that is going on. They're conversing. He's told him he can go. He's been pushed out. And there you see him with his last pit stop. That's all he's got to do in the pits today. He's really revving the engine as he leaves pit lane. Well, the net result of those two pit stops is that Al Anser has lengthened his lead now over Tom Steva. Only cars on the same lap, but then John Cox, Krisilov, and Dallenbach will be back for the finish of the 500. Al Anser with a 14-second lead has just about three laps to go in the 1978 Indianapolis 500. Jackie mentioned he'll be 39 years old tomorrow. What a birthday present. It appears he's going to give himself. Well, I don't know. He's 14 seconds ahead. I've been uh, that far ahead and things have still gone wrong for me. You know, I just sit in a race car at this time and I sit in this commentary position trembling for that man Al Unser because so many things, thousands of moving parts can let you down. And although you've got that cushion, 14 seconds is not a very long way when you're traveling up to 200 miles an hour down the back stretch. Well, how much did you lead by when your car broke down on you in the closing laps here? Well, I was almost two laps in the lead with only eight laps to go. Oh. And my first year in Indianapolis, and suddenly the engine just gave out. And I can tell you that was uh, an expensive experience. It might be a lot of money for an American, but for a Scotsman, it was a disaster. <laughs> Well, it would take something like that, however, to stop Al Unser at this point. As you said, it, it must be a very, very dicey moment inside the race car when all you can do is just pray that it all holds together. 
he's driving it so smoothly now you would think his fingers had been filed away just to almost the flesh so they can feel every vibration look at his head tossing back and forward he's looking in his mirror there he was looking one side then he was looking at the other side so conscious of everybody in the racetrack looking ahead making sure nobody's going to make any silly mistakes ahead of him he can't afford to get himself into any trouble when he comes up to lap a car now he gives it a wide bear but you know that lap that lead of his has come down from 14 to 12 and now to 10 would you think he'd want to slow down that much even though he's taking it easy you know i was worried he's had the white flag with one lap to go so he's in good shape but i was concerned that the front wing may have been damaged in some way when he came in there and hit that wheel on his last pit stop that could be dangerous look at this Here's another car behind him. John That's Gordon John Cox. He's keeping well out of Gordon John Cox's way. He doesn't want to begin getting involved in any race at this time with only half a lap to go. Half a lap until his third Indianapolis 500 victory. He's slowed down now, if you call it slowing down, to 179.140 miles per hour. Slowed down about five or six miles per hour, and John Cox would buy him. I'm dead right. He should let him go by. There's no reason for him to keep him behind, and he's just going around there straddling the yellow line as he comes down the front stretch for the last time. The checkered flag will be waved by Pat Fidan for Al Unser of Albuquerque. He has won his third Indianapolis 500, joining the names of Louis Meyer, of Wilbur Shaw, of Maury Rose and A.J. Foyt as the only man who have won this race three times. A.J., of course, has won it four with his victory last year. But Al Unser now in that very exclusive society of three-time winners. There he is. Oh, breathing relief. Look at Karen, the lovely Karen, his wife there. She doesn't know where to look. She, doesn't, she must be a happy lady right now. Oh, what uh, a lovely kiss. Okay. Karen waiting for her husband, Al Unser. Waving in orange plain retardant glove. There's A.J. Foyt, the final humiliation of the day. He stopped on the race course, ran out of fuel, no doubt. There also is Wally Dallenbeck in car number six. He's also out of fuel. He will finish well, though. Dallenbeck unofficially in fifth or sixth place. We'll have the final official standings. A.J. Foyt's going to be eighth or ninth, it appears. But into victory lane is Al Unser. It's all over. Took something over three hours to do in intense heat and humidity at Indianapolis. We would suspect he's not feeling it very much right now. The crowd still all in place, some 350 to 400,000 of them. America's largest one-day sporting crowd. There's his wife, Karen, on the left side of the picture. Off comes the balaclava. What a happy couple they are right now. What a wonderful feeling. All right, Chris Economaki is moving in for his usual interview with the winner, a shot from the Goodyear Plimp. Okay, Chris. Al, Al, congratulations. A fine drive for an all-new team. You know, this is number three for you. How does it rate with the others? Well, Chris, I'll tell you, you know, each one is the same. Uh, this feels like my first win that I've ever had here. I, I just have a real good feeling, and uh, I'm happy. That's that's the main reason. Uh, you always want to keep winning, and, and uh, you're only sad when you don't win. Al, it's just a couple of weeks. It's a tough crack on the head all month long. I've been asking you up to with the 500. Here you win. How do you feel physically? Well, physically, I feel in good shape, uh, Chris. I, I went very strong all day. I didn't get tired whatsoever. There was some doubt in my mind whether I was ready or not because of the crash, but uh, thanks to Jim's long patience and Huey's long patience and the doctor's help, here I am. Hey, Karen. What are you thinking about? I don't know. My mind is just blank right now. I'm just so happy. I can't believe it. Okay, Jim Hall, what a way to get into the total track racing. A former sports car champion, car owner, congratulations. What are your thoughts, Jim? Well, I'm, I'm really pleased. I think Al did a terrific job out there. This is uh, probably one of the toughest races to win in the world, and uh, this combination just turned out good. I'm, I'm really pleased. How much fuel did he have left? Uh, we had enough, Chris, and I didn't look to see how many gallons were left. I knew we had enough. Okay, there are the final unofficial results. We haven't heard from one member of our commentary team yet, Sam Posey, the well-known American sports car driver, author, and painter. He's in the garage area now with Janet Guthrie. Okay, Sam. Janet, a lot of people said a woman could never drive 500 miles, and here you are. Tell us a little about the feeling of the race. Well, that's nonsense, Sam. I mean, I've been running these 500, 600 mile stock car races down south for two years now, and, and this, this is really easier you know, than, than uh, 
uh, horsing a, uh, a stock car around. Those tracks are so rough, they're all high bank. Here, of course, everything's very precise, very delicate. It's more mentally fatiguing, but the, the physical. Sam, I was driving with one hand. <laughs> is that true? Uh, is that because you were trying to rest the other hand, or, uh, or just because you felt so comfortable in the car? No, I had a little problem a couple of days ago. I uh, actually have a broken wrist, and, and uh, um, so, you know, I drove with one hand. I was, when I had to shift, I held on with my right hand and ran my uh, left hand across the cockpit to shift with. That was pit stops and yellows. So, uh, you know, I mean, what is this nonsense about women can't do it? <laughs> well, it seems to me it's high time. It's uh, put to rest. You finished either eighth or ninth, depending on uh, the way the last couple of laps sorted out. Oh, is that right? I thought it was nice. Well, that's, that's very good. Well, you know, I've said all along that I thought the Texaco Star was going to run all day. It's a predictable car. It's an easy car to drive because it tells you exactly what it's going to do. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't have any nasty tricks up its sleeve. Uh, and thanks to George Vignati's preparation, of course, and the efforts of all my guys. You know, the drive is just the middle, most visible part in this game. People don't realize that. There's a, a, a mountain of people behind me that have resulted in this car finishing eighth here, not the least of which, of course, Texaco that made it all happen. Did you have any problems at all? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, a few. Next year I'm going to make sure I have a longer car. <laughs> a longer car? A longer car. That car was a little bit too short for me, and by midpoint my right foot felt like I was standing on a hot poker. Yeah, I could have used about three more inches between me and the firewall. Janet revealing for the first time anybody she drove with a broken wrist. The lady can literally drive with one hand tied behind her back and compete with the men. There's a controversy still on this race involving George Pignati and those penalization laps. We'll be back. All right, we're still at Indianapolis. The crowd beginning to file out a little bit, but Bill Fleming has pursued George Pignati, the team manager of one of the teams, each of whose cars were penalized one lap. We understand he's a little upset about it. Bill, what's the story down there? I'm with crew chief George Bignati of the Steve Krisloff Gordon Johncock team. And uh, as we reported earlier, each of those drivers was penalized one lap. One for going too fast under the Pacer yellow uh, numbers and the other for running over an air hose. So let's get the uh, opinion out of the race is over from George Bignati. George, it certainly it did have an effect on the end of the race as far as you're concerned. Well, I guess so. Uh, I don't know if we could have beat Al. He was running uh, real fast, but whenever you penalize uh, a race, you know, uh, a lap, that's uh, almost 50 seconds. And uh, I think that uh, it was an uh, unjust uh, ruling. I don't know where they came up with that, but uh, uh, we didn't really run over the hose. Uh, Al Unser ran over his hose and hit a tire, and they didn't penalize him. And so until this is uh, posted and we have a chance to go in and investigate it, we really don't know, but I got $1,000 in my pocket, and I'm going to protest it because uh, I don't like to see uh, uh, one team get uh, penalized and the other one let go. We all got to be treated alike. And uh, so uh, I'm very happy that my three cars, I should say two, our cars and Janet got three finished. And uh, that's pretty good when you get three of them in a race and run 500 miles and they finish. So it's a big uh, tribute to Louis Meyer, my engine man. And uh, so I'm pretty happy about that. So we'll have to go to USAC and find out just what the heck's going on. All right, that's the story then of the protest of George Vignati and both Steve Krisloff and Gordon Johncock.